Hi, everybody. I'm Tom Valentine, coming to you via Radio Freemasonry. Just kidding, folks. Thought I'd give you a little heart attack there. This is William Cooper, and you're listening to the Hour of the Time. Tom was at it again tonight, but we're not going to waste any words on him. People who have been listening to this program since its inception on May the 4th, 1992, know exactly who is who and what is what. We have revealed the true enemy that Radio Freemasonry continues to deny in our series of 32 audio tapes that were aired on the hour of the time, which is 32 hours of broadcast, identifying the mystery religion of Babylon, its history up to the modern day, and its hiding place, the cockroaches behind the veil of the secret societies, of which Tom Valentine is a member. Ladies and gentlemen, if you are a new listener to this broadcast, I don't have the time to replay everything or to reiterate everything. If you're sincerely interested, order the tapes that we have produced. If you're not, don't waste our time and don't waste Tom Valentine's time. I'm too busy, folks trying to save this country to play your stupid, silly little games. There are, and I'm going to say this again, you better listen. There are people set on bringing about a one-world totalitarian socialist government. They operate in secret. Behind innocent-looking front organizations such as Freemasonry, the ancient Order of the Rose Cross, are Rosa Crucis, the Knights Templar, the Sovereign and Military Order of the Knights of Malta, and many, many others, at times appearing to oppose themselves, but always moving us toward that one goal through the Hegelian dialectic of political conflict resolution. They have always succeeded because the sheeple of the world have always believed that their leaders were taking them in the right direction and could do no wrong. And that has been your downfall forever. For these people have succeeded by creating issues and controlling both sides. The moment you organize a patriot organization, it is then infiltrated and controlled from within. If you don't believe that, examine the membership of your patriot leaders in the lodges of the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry, the York Rite of Freemasonry, the Ancient Order of Rosa Crucius, the Sovereign and Military Order of the Knights of Malta, the Knights Templar, and folks, many, many others. If you really want to wake up, you continue to listen to the hour of the time. For we don't bore you with suppositions. And we don't tell you that if you give sustenance to the symbology of the pyramid and stuff. You're just, you're just making it more powerful. That's bullshit. They are powerful because they are real, ladies and gentlemen. And it wasn't the man that Tom Valentine mentioned who put the pyramid on our dollar bill. It was our founding fathers who created the great seal of the United States of America, both the obverse and the reverse. It just wasn't used until it was placed on the dollar bill. That's the truth of the matter. Make sure you have pen and paper by your side every moment when you listen to this program because we don't play those games. We give you facts. 
We give you bibliographies. We quote right out of their own mouths. We cite the law page and paragraph. And we don't play silly games with anybody. Don't go away. I'll be right back. Well, folks, we have a special guest tonight. Last Thursday, we started our series on treason. Treason. The counterfeit government, which calls itself the government of the United States of America, is not. Is not, I repeat. I renounce it. I expose them. They are illegal, unlawful, unconstitutional, and are, in fact, not the constitutional government of the United States of America, and have not been for a long, long time, and we are proving it on this program. We are proving the treason, their long history throughout the ages, what they have done in the law to subvert and destroy this nation and bring about their one world totalitarian socialist in their own words, ladies and gentlemen, in their own words. I wrote about all this in my book as I first began to open my eyes and discover what was happening when I was a member of the Office of Naval Intelligence many years ago. After over 20 years of research, I wrote a book. In this book, I outlined everything that I had discovered and eventually began broadcasting on May the 4th, 1992, the hour of the time. Many people began to listen to this program in disbelief, set out to prove me wrong, and found the documentation that I stated to be, in fact, in existence, to be real. Many of them joined my intelligence-gathering organization, CADU, the Citizens Agency for Joint Intelligence, and began operating in secret, digging out information wherever they worked, wherever they lived, in government, out of government, within law enforcement agencies, within the military, everywhere. And we have put it together piece by piece, point by point, and everyone who has set out to prove me wrong has proved me right. And we have as our guest tonight one of those people, a CADGI member, one of the best researchers in our organization, who has duplicated all of my original research, as have several others. Whenever we assign research projects, or whenever someone volunteers for a research project, we always assign other CADGI members to duplicate the research. In this manner, if one misses something, the other one invariably catches it. On the other end of this phone, ladies and gentlemen, is a man named Paul, who has operated in secret for many months, digging out what you are hearing in this series on treason. It is a duplication of my original research, and he has produced by far the most voluminous amount of material from his documentation of the treason, the destruction of the United States of America, than any other Kajime member to date although there are other CADGI members working on this material, and some have contributed substantially. Paul, I want to welcome you to the hour of the time. Thank you, Mr. Cooper. And uh, why don't we start out? I remember, uh, did I, I, you know, to this day, I don't know if you read my book, did you? Um, parts of it. I haven't had time to finish it. <laughs> You've been too busy, haven't you? A little bit, yeah. Well, I remember sitting at home one day, and you as a CADGI member, of course, had a phone number to be able to reach me at any time that you need to. And you called me at home and said that you had been listening to the hour of the time and wanted to find documentation for some of the things that I had uh, put out over the air. And I told you where this documentation was and what it was, and you asked me if I could furnish it to you. And what was my answer, Paul? Well, we have to dig it up ourselves. And that's the way to do it. So I told you you had to dig it up yourself, and of course nobody ever likes to hear that, but what did you do after that? Well, I had had some trouble trying to find it in the library, and you just kind of guided me along as to, I wasn't aware there was an appendix to the congressional record, and you stated that there was, and I went and dug further, and sure enough, it was there. So most of the people who set out to do research, I know most of the people who set out to uh, find this uh, voluminous amount of material have started with the uh, Arms Control and Disarmament Act, and uh, as soon as they got to the paragraph that said 
that uh, and, uh, until the law is changed or until there is a treaty made, no provision of this uh, treaty is to be construed to mean the disarmament of the American people. They stopped there. What did you do? Well, um, I remember your program last spring with um, you were discussing the disarmament and you told the people to go do their homework and look it up. And I went and looked it up and it's so unbelievable. I kept looking and looking and I kept digging and digging and um, it's unbelievable what's there. There's a lot more there that we haven't had time to dig up. That's true. Uh, can you take us sort of step by step? How did you, where did you go and what did you do? And how did you ultimately find... I remember one conversation we had. You said you'd reached a dead end and the librarian wasn't too helpful. And I gave you some hints on how to handle the librarian. And uh, did, you, uh, did you ever use any of those techniques that I gave you? Well, definitely, yes. Um, when dealing with librarians, um, unfortunately, many of them don't know much what's going on in the federal document area. And, the nicer a person is, and when you work with the librarian and sometimes suggest things instead of telling them what to do, they they are a lot more friendly, and they really will do what they can to find things. And unfortunately, uh, I've had to take things up on my own that they couldn't even find. It just it just takes a little common sense and some digging to find things. And it's important to work with the librarians, though, and really show that you appreciate all the work that they're doing and how they're teaching us to find these things, too. In other words, a little bit of honey goes a long way, doesn't it? Yeah, a long way. <laughs> Did you ever take her a flower or a bag of donuts or something? Um, not yet. That, <laughs> that library is quite a ways from here. So. Okay. And usually it's a different librarian, so it's kind of hard to uh, work that one out. But I do. Um, they do want to have access to the information and when it's available they've all been very interested in it so um, I'm trying to work with them as soon as we get it available. So it begins to open their eyes also, doesn't it? Oh yeah, they had no idea whatsoever. Actually no one does. Uh, Paul, the, the, you know, the biggest reason that I wanted you on the program tonight is because I keep getting from people, well I'm just one helpless person, I don't have access to the material that you do, uh, I don't know how to do research and what they're really telling me is, oh, it sounds like work. I'm not going to do that. Uh, that's what that's what it translates to in my mind. And I'm not going to let them get away with it. So I wanted you on the show tonight because when I tell them that every bit of this is in the public domain and anybody that's got perseverance and is willing to work can dig it out. And you're living proof of that, aren't you? Yes, um, I must admit so. It's it sure helped with all your input with, you know, that disarmament program you did and, you know, let alone the banking and all the other areas I've worked with. But you also gave Mrs. Smith's address at the end of that program to thank her. And I also dropped her a line and thanked her. And between you and she both, you have walked me through. Um, some things are, because we don't know much about libraries, hard to find. And, you know, thanks to you and Stan when he was still helping you and um, Bernadine. I mean, all three of you, have, I probably wouldn't have found half of what I did if it weren't for your help. So, so, I mean, those guidelines really do help people, and they save a lot of time. Absolutely. And the, the program that we did uh, on uh, Bernadine Smith's material, uh, you then, through me, contacted her, and uh, she was able to help you in your research also. Exactly. Exactly. Well, let's, uh, why don't you start out and tell us how you began and what you started to find and tell us about some of the uh, mile posts, in other words, those times when you just stood there and said, oh, my God, and, uh, and, and then what you did next. And also, I want to make a point, folks, that this guy, you know, this isn't the only thing he has to do. Uh, this this is a very busy, busy person. Uh, he attends classes. He has commitments. He has family commitments, just like everybody. Um, he has a lot of work to do and really, tell you the truth, when he first started this, he expressed a doubt as to whether he would have the time to do this research or not. And uh, he certainly uh, persevered and made the time. And he didn't have any more free time than I would say probably 95% of all of you listening. So why don't you go ahead and start. I'm just going to turn it over to you and I'll tell you when the break gets here and just uh, tell us the whole story. Perfect. Three things I'd like to start out with, first of all. First of all, I'd like to thank you for um, discussing this on short wave because 
that's the only way I found out about it, okay? And I thank you for that and your help and Stan's help because he helped me. He was still helping you at that time. And secondly, I'd also like to thank your sponsor, Swiss America, for financing your airtime so that, you know, some of us out here are waking up and we're, we are working on doing things about that. And, you know, thirdly, um, Bernadine, you gave me her um, address and I contacted her. And between all three of you, I mean, this work wouldn't be where it is right now. So I, first of all, I mean, that's important that, you know, all of you realize how much you've helped and we're in this together. But um, I remember the first program, um, I don't, on a whim, I picked up the short wave about a year or so ago, and I don't know how I tuned in, but I tuned in, and one of the nights you were discussing disarmament and that it was all documented and in the federal documents, and I just, it was unbelievable, and I didn't, I jotted down some things, and my notes were kind of hard to read, and thankfully you ran a rerun. And I taped that one, and I started going to the library to find out if it was true, because you challenged us to do our homework. Well, um, I didn't want to believe it was true, but if it was, it's something seriously we all better face. And if we don't face it, we're going to regret it. So I, the local library is pretty small, so I started going to the nearest library that's a federal depository. It's about 25, 30 miles away, and um, they had some documents, but not many of the older documents. So then I went to the, a larger city quite a ways away, and they're a major federal depository, and they have had every single document but one. And um, I just started learning how to use the monthly catalog and digging up federal doc numbers and doc numbers, and I copy everything, and then I bring it home, and now when I started compiling this, I just, it's, it's unbelievable. It's all there. It's just, it's unbelievable. But the key is, is we got to wake up and realize this, and when we get this information available, in order to save people time, all the SUDOC numbers are included, all the page numbers, um, newspaper articles, it's always the page numbers included, the section number. So if anybody wants to confirm it, and it's important that they do confirm it for themselves, this will save them a lot of time in the library so they can get educated and educate other people and start moving ahead and saving our country because it's, it's getting down to the wire. Yep. And as you get through all this documentation with the public, if they're going to start realizing that if they don't act now, they're going to be staring at the AK-47 to their head. So, what was the uh, what was the first document you found where you realized that this was in fact treason? Um, I started. I went right in sequence with the way you did the program, and I believe it was it would have been the public life of the two nine seven, and then. Off of that comes the blueprint for the peace race and the uh, State Department document 7277. And that showed you, in fact, that the United States was operating jointly with the Soviet Union in order to create a one world government. Yes, and that they were planning a one world government under the United Nations and they were pretty open about it. But the people, from what I have heard, I wasn't that, I wasn't even, I wasn't even born then, but from the people I've talked to, there was a lot of resistance. They did not, the American people did not want this, and that ex explains one reason why it's so under the rug right now. And it's, it's all there if people would just look, but um, they're not open about it because they know the American people don't want it. And they wouldn't want it. And it's got to be done in secret, otherwise, it wouldn't be happening. But they're getting more and more bold. So um, after Public Light 7. 297, um, a lot of things kind of happened uh, probably through guidance and stuff, but um, I started finding out where to find out how many times it was voted on and amended, you know, find it was passed in 1961, what was it current now? And through digging and documentation, I got it all the way to the current data as in Supplement 4 of the United States Code, and it, it, it's still there, and they've even added to it, and they've even made it a little bit more explicit. So, um, off of that, you know, with the blueprint for the peace race and then 7277, um, I remember skimming through a section in your book on the one world government, because, I mean, if anyone sits down and thinks about it, what is the purpose of a complete and total disarmament? The whole purpose is a one world government. 
and to most people, that's a new idea, and um, that's so easily documented. It, it's unbelievable. It's just we got to know where to look, and that's when I ran into that one problem, finding the appendix from, I believe it was 1955, and different testimony entered into the congressional record openly talking about the one, um, a one-world government. And that's when I called you, and um, you told me there is an appendix. You know, you just got to dig a little bit deeper, and sure enough, it's all there. Did you uh, did you ever get mad at me because I wouldn't really give you the answers you wanted to hear but made you go work for it? Uh, no. I've been raised that it's, when you do things yourself, it's you're a lot more, it's far better down the road. And I, I just appreciated how much help you did give. Because, um, you know, it's learning how to dig up these documents is something no one can put a price on. I just, I mean, when I go into a library now, 95% if not more, I can put my finger on it instantly because I know how to find it. And to me, I, I probably wouldn't have known that if you just would have told me how to get the number. And I... Um, I appreciate you not telling me. <laughs> well, you're you're a rare individual because most people do get angry. But in this process, you have in fact become an expert library researcher, and in fact are better at finding things in a library than probably 99% of all librarians who do this as a profession for their entire life. Unfortunately, yes. Um, we would hope our librarians would know and. Um, there are some really good, good librarians out there, and they really try to help. And yes, there are. We, we certainly don't want to take away from them. There are some excellent librarians out there. But unfortunately, in that socialist mentality, there's a lot of them who don't care, and they don't have the foggiest idea, and they let you know that, too. Yeah, and a lot of them are indeed, in fact, socialists, aren't they? Oh, yeah. And could account for the for the disappearance of some books from some libraries, although I'm not accusing them of that because we don't know who, in fact, is removing certain books from libraries. But uh, this is happening across the country. Have you uh, discovered that in your research? Yes. Every single document I have looked for, I have found. But sometimes you got to come in from a different avenue. And the one main library I do most of my research at, um, I sent down for the... State Department document 7277, and uh, they couldn't find it. I asked the librarian, I said it was an important document, if she could go look, and she went and looked personally twice. And she came back up and she said, all I can tell you is that it was either stolen or it was misshelved. And I thought, well, isn't that a coincidence? But I was able to get that one to the library loan, so I just came in from a different angle, and thankfully it wasn't stolen at that library or disappeared. So. Now, since then, we've done a library search and found that, as far as we can tell, on the library search computers, it only exists in two libraries in the country at the present time. We are not going to name those libraries because we do not want them to disappear from those libraries. However, it is for sale in the John Birch Society bookstores across the country. So if you have a Birch Society bookstore in your uh, town, you can get a copy of 7277 from them. Or you can just wait until we finish the publication of this entire set of uh, documents. The entire research project will be published as a complete uh, set of documents uh, with total and complete references and uh, sources and uh, everything. I mean, it, it will be the most incredible uh, evidence of the treasonous destruction of the United States of America uh, that's ever been published uh, in the history of this country. Now, uh, Paul, during your your uh, uh, research, you at some point found, as I found many years ago as, as a member of the Office of Naval Intelligence, that it was not coming to world government, but in fact the world government was already instituted and in place, and we are uh, subordinate to the United Nations Charter at this time and are, in actual fact, a state of the United Nations. What did you think when you discovered that? To tell you the honest truth, um, all of this stuff that I have found and documented and, you know, your help found, it just, I still shake my head. I know I, I do believe it because I've gone and I've dug it up and I've copied it and I've read it. Um, it just, it's so unbelievable that some of our political leaders, in fact, most of them, either out of ignorance or just because 
they believed in this would sell out our country. I mean, that is that is really hard to believe, and it's really hard to accept. And that's one of the main reasons I documented this. I mean, this stuff is far out, and I had to go. I mean, dig it up. And if it is true, it's something we got to face up to and be responsible and deal with it and move ahead. And if it isn't, well, so be it. Well. Unfortunately, it is true, and I've told you at times too. Um, there's times when it's just like a, it's like a dream. You know, I'd wish someone would prove me wrong, and I'd wish someone would say, "Wake up!" You know, it's just a dream, and unfortunately, it's not. That's right, it's not. And all of this documentation comes right out of the congressional record, right out of the United States code books, right out of the records of the United Nations, right out of the newspapers of the world, right out of State Department documentation. Uh, this is not conjecture at all. It is actual fact. And, and according to the Executive and Judicial Department interpretation of Article 6, of the United States Constitution, the United States of America, in fact, does not exist anymore, but is a state of the United Nations under the United Nations Charter, and they are, in fact, in the process of disarming all nations of the world to bring into reality their one-world totalitarian socialist state. And one interesting thing I'd like to throw in, and um, that it's very clear in the State Department document 7277, word for word, it states specifically that the states, meaning the country's armies, will be reduced and they cannot, um, their forces will be reduced in such a small number where there is no way they can challenge the UN army. And that is a serious thing that the people must realize is that if we do have somewhat of a military left, it is only for policing at a national level and, uh, and it, not challenging the UN in any in any form. Yeah, and the real reason for the uh, for it will be to police us. Yes. In fact, not to protect us from some outside force, but to subordinate us to the United Nations uh, dictates. And one interesting thing too about the United Nations that um, I was. I don't know how many people really realize this. I wasn't aware of it until I started reading this, but um, when this is compiled, you'll get copies of it. Um, that the, We hear a lot about human rights, which is one of the United Nations conventions or charters and um, treaties. And what's interesting is if a person would read the Human Rights Convention right from the United Nations, which was co-authored with Mrs. Roosevelt, um, and also read the Russian Constitution, they will find that many of the articles are word for word. And Ab absolutely word for word. And that's what the people have to realize, is that a one world government under the UN is welcome to the Fourth Reich. I mean, it's, it's cut and dried, and I'm trying to get my hands right now on the new Russian constitution to compare it to the old one and the UN human rights, and when we get that compiled, you know, we'll get it available through you and stuff, but the people have to realize, I mean, if they sat down and read the United Nations Charter, it is it has nothing to do with our Bill of Rights. It's exactly opposite of our Bill of Rights, and I'm, I just received in the mail today um, Bucho Bucho Scali's book, An Agenda for, for Peace, right from the United Nations, and we'll have to try and get that available with the documentation, because it's, it's unbelievable. He said the League of Nations, unfortunately, failed, and now, you know, we're going to do it through the United Nations. I mean, they're, they're pretty clear as to what they're doing. That's right. And, folks, uh, uh, old Mr. Tom Valentine tried to make you not listen to me by trying to connect me with, with UFOs. The truth is, is Tom Valentine wanted me to talk about UFOs in his show, and it wasn't until I linked UFOs to the New World Order that he all of a sudden cut me off and said that he wasn't going to continue with me on the second hour. That's what scared Mr. Valentine, because Mr. Valentine is involved in this. If you listen to his show long enough, you'll see that he is covering up the real information that you need to know and that you will only hear on the hour of the time. Nowhere else. Paul, um, what else can you uh, go into that can enlighten people out there? Are there any shortcuts in research, any things that you found that people normally would not know where to look that, uh, that they can go and uh, uh, will, will help them find information faster? Well, if a person has a federal SUDOC number, 
that will take hours and hours of time. Okay, now why don't you explain to us exactly what that is? Well, according to the federal documents, every federal government document from the United States Government Clean Office has a federal SUDOC. The Library of Congress has its own number, so the SUDOC number doesn't do much good, but you can find the librarians usually can help you find the Library of Congress number. But in all the other libraries, with the federal deposit, which are federal depositories, you can simply, with the SUDOC number, go to the federal depository area and give them that SUDOC number, and they will pull up the document instantly for you. Right now, hold on, because we've got to take a break. I'll be right back. Okay, Paul, can you uh, continue where you left off? Sure. Um, when we were talking about the federal SUDOC numbers, the key issue is that the library is not a federal depository. Um, and you can ask any librarian if your local library is. If it isn't, so, all you need is that federal SUDOC number, and you give them the number and the title with it, and they will transfer that document in. Either they will copy it for you, or they will transfer it in where you can copy it or study it. So that's why when I compiled all this, Every single page has a federal SUDAC number or a state stat or a federal stat number. And, you know, newspaper articles, um, I got to the point where I get leads from different people or I see copies of different so called Patriot stuff. And it was rather annoying because I never gave page numbers and usually just dates. And unfortunately, I did find a lot of typographical errors and there are some documents that I never did find. And, um, there are a lot of there are in fact a lot of documents floating around the Patriot community that are frauds, isn't that correct? That's what I would say, yes. And unless people go document it themselves, they'll never know if they're being deceived or if they know what's actually going on. And that's why when we get this available it's the page number, the section number, everything is included so anyone can go look it up themselves and find it. Now there's one thing is if if you want to go look up um any type of federal document, and there's thousands of them out there, and they're still being published currently, is there's a government publication called the Monthly Catalog. Some of these are published just monthly, and they're, you'll find them in the library monthly in a paper soft cover. Some of the libraries, the larger libraries, will actually find these in the books, usually by year, by yearly, it depends how many, they're, um, how fast the books are for each month. But if you want to look up, like, State Department 7277, you simply look up um, the title in the monthly catalog in the index. And sometimes you gotta, you got to dig and look under different subject headings, but you should probably find that one under Freedom from War. But you're not going to find it the date that, as of it was released, September 1961. You probably won't find it until um, October or November sometimes even five months later in the monthly catalog. So sometimes it takes some digging through different monthly catalogs, finding that actual federal document as to when it was printed in the monthly catalog. And in the monthly catalog, you will be given the federal SUDOC number. And from there, everything, you simply show the librarian that number and they'll pull up the document or they'll transfer it in from another library. And not all libraries will have a monthly catalog, so you'll have to find a... Uh, a library that has the monthly catalog um, where you can look it up or, you know, all this documentation that we'll make available, they won't even need access to monthly catalogs. They'll just have a doc number and they can send it in through library loan or whatever. And it'll save hours and hours of time. And unfortunately, it's rather annoying when, um, not on your end, though, but on other people's end, that they would have certain citations and they just... They don't exist. Now, either it's a typographical error or it's an honest mistake or it's an intentional mistake, and you never know unless you go dig it up, and that's that's crucial, especially with a lot of these far-fetched ideas coming out in the so-called patriots. Yeah. Did you ever go look for one document that I ever cited that was not in existence? Let's see. Did I ever run that by me one more time? Did you ever hear me cite a document on this show or in my book and go look for that document and not be able to find it? No. Every single document that you have talked about, I have been able to find. I want to take a, a, a moment here to uh, talk to the audience for just a second. Many of you fax us newspaper articles, information, newsletters. Some of you send this stuff through the mail. 
And I've got to tell you right now, anything that we get that does not specifically state the source, the location, the page, the section, all of these things that we're talking about here, we never use. You're wasting your time if you send us something that we cannot find. If you just send us a page uh, with writing on it, or you clip out an article in a paper, and you don't write the name of the paper, the date that the paper uh, came out on, the page that this article appeared on, or the section and the page of the newspaper, it just goes into the trash can because we can't use it. Everything that's ever sent to us, we farm out to a CAGI member, or else I do the research myself, or Carolyn does it, and it must be duplicated by us so that we know it's genuine before we ever use it. If you are not willing to do that for us when you send these things to us, then don't bother sending them. Recently, I got several pages Xerox from a book. Whoever sent these pages to us had very carefully cut out the page numbers and the name of the book on the pages before he sent them. Why he would ever do that, I don't know. However, since I've read The Two Babylons... I recognized that these were pages from the book, The Two Babylons. And uh, uh, since we have the book, we didn't need it. But why would anybody do something like that? Why would anybody send us information that would not reference the source? Well, folks, sometimes it's because you don't know to do that, and you think you're doing us a favor. And sometimes it's a completely fraudulent document with the intention of getting me to use it in order to discredit William Cooper, Kaji, and the Hour of the Time. It'll never work, because if we can't duplicate the research, folks, it's never used by Kaji, by William Cooper, or by the Hour of the Time. Paul, you recently uh, took a trip. Where'd you go? I was in Washington, D.C. You were in the mouth of the beast. <laughs> Got it. And uh, did you uh, have some interesting experiences while you were there? Yeah, very interesting. Would you, um, would you like to recount some of the more interesting? Yeah, um, I'd like to throw one other thing out so quick on the research and stuff. Um, what what still I find astonishing is that um, I did rather well in school, and I went to a private school, thankfully, because my parents sacrificed for that. But what surprises me is I have not met one person to this day who knows what exists in the libraries and how to find it in person. And I find it so fascinating that there are thousands of government documents. They have years and years of government documents on weather control and all these different subjects that exist. And that astonishes me that we were never taught any of this in school. And I find that very interesting. And it was really frustrating at first. I remember one of the first nights I was in the library and I used my calling card and I called Stan and I asked him. I said, you know, I'm having difficulty finding this because we had the newer United States Code. And... Um, he told me, he said, look in Title 22, and he kind of walked me through it, and sure enough, it was there, but at first, it was really frustrating, it was a lot of hard work, but I believe we have to know what's going on, and we have to have the facts when we talk to people, and the more a person works with it, the easier it gets to be, and now, he, most things, I can walk in and just put my finger on things pretty easily, but ironically, in Washington, um, and this is nothing against librarians at the Library of Congress, but um, there are some exceptional librarians there. Unfortunately, they don't work every day. <laughs> but um, it was really interesting in the law library section. Um, I was asking them, um, actually, what is a charter and how it's issued by Congress and what are the rules and how a person can find that, and they didn't know. And um, that's something I had to pursue on my own, and uh, I had another lead from a friend, and I have to go through the Judiciary Committee on that, but it's it's just because a person may not find the answer they're looking for at that time, you got to come in from different, on different angles, different perspectives, and you got to keep digging until you find it or until you prove that whatever lead you're going on is not an accurate lead. And, um, that was interesting, and it was interesting, too, as everything was shut down conveniently for the weather, and um, there, uh, up here, we just we just had a week of 35 below, and it's, it's cold. But down there, um, they they're a bunch of socialists. They're more than willing to get a free day off. But um, when we were down there, we had a we paid a little visit to the House of the Temple, which is ironically 13 blocks directly north of the White House, and in a perfect square with uh, Washington's obelisk with uh, Capitol, and. It's a very interesting 
very interesting building. And now, many of our listeners don't know what you're talking about. Some of them are new listeners. Just exactly what is the House of the Temple, Paul? The uh, House of the Temple is the head building of the Supreme Council of the Southern Jurisdiction of the Scottish Rite in the 33rd degree. And um, I didn't know it existed. I lived out in Washington for a while, and until I started tuning into you, I had no idea what the secret societies were, or, and obviously the Masons, and I didn't even know that place existed until I ran into someone who said that, and I made it a point to visit there the next time I went to Washington, and we did visit. And um, ironically, when you see the outside of the building, there are two there are two sphinxes in front. One has its eyes wide open and one has its eyes semi-closed or semi-open. And according to the tour guide, they're symbolic of power and knowledge. And you can't have one without the other and vice versa. And the uh, temple is shaped... Now, wait a minute. Did you hear that, folks? Power and knowledge. And you can't have one without the other. My people perish for lack of knowledge. Go ahead, Paul. Okay. And you'll notice that the temple is shaped uh, at the top. It's a pyramid without a capstone on it. But there's 33 columns on the outside, and they're all 33 feet tall. And the walls, as you go in the temple, on the front door, on the knocker, the lion's head, okay, on each door. And as you go in, the walls are 8 feet thick of solid marble. I believe it's marble or granite. 8 feet solid thick. And what's interesting is that... Um, you go in there, the tour guide had an interesting comment. He said that um, what the Masons teach is freedom of thought, freedom of speech, and freedom of action, which is an interesting freedom that's added. That's right. Very interesting, because you and um, when your guest, um, Ralph Epperson, A. Ralph Epperson, were on, you very clearly pointed out the freedom of action. And as you go in, they will... Um, they're willing to let you take photographs. They're willing to let you actually do a movie or a video camera. Um, there's one room they won't let you do that in, and that's J. Edgar Hoover's room, who was a 33rd degree and a nice Templar, and among other things. But they show different pictures of major people who are Masons, and um, the symbology. Um, they come across like they're a very benevolent group, and um, I've documented in Albert Pike's um, Book Morals and Dogma. He has his own special room there, and his body is buried at the temple. That's right. His body, General Christopher Albert Pike, is buried in the house of the temple. Exactly. And what's interesting is I did find Morals and Dogma at a library, but conveniently some of the pages have been cut out. But besides the point, um, after... It's very clear that the first three degrees, he's very clear in his book about that. They don't know what's going on. And the tour guide and the few Masons I meet, they come across like they're a very benevolent, charitable organization. And if a person didn't know the secret underlying truth as to what the 33rd degrees and higher know, um, they probably would be awestruck with the whole temple. But thankfully... Um, the symbology is everywhere. The serpents, uh, as you look on the outside of the temple, looking in on three sides, you'll see the rising sun with the double-headed eagle, which is the new symbol of um, coat, of seal, um, coat of arms for Russia. It's on their new coin, the double-headed eagle. And you'll also see the serpents. Um, what's fascinating inside, um, sometimes, Bill, maybe you should have someone go into a video, and then you can make that available, like the um, Hotel Lex. Lux, it's Luxor? Luxor, yeah. Yeah, because I think people, I mean, it confirms everything that you've said about the secret society, but one of the most astonishing things, it's no matter where we turn, we keep finding these people. Um, they were rather excited because they have a Masonic apron, and it's a very special Masonic apron. The picture that we see of the man standing on the moon in the spacesuit is conveniently holding this Masonic apron. Now, wait a minute. Let's go back. Which photograph are you talking about? Um, I'd have to... I'm trying to remember which one. If he's, if he's just standing there facing, you know, the viewer. Uh, is he holding the flag or anything? I don't recall if he's holding the flag. All I, all I know is he pointed out he was holding the Masonic apron, and you can see it clearly in the photograph, the square in the compass, if you look, and that's what blew me away, so I didn't even notice. <laughs> all I noticed, it was 
you know, the, when I grew up in school, that is the common picture we saw of the man standing on the moon. And what floored me was his letter was there. He's a 33rd degree mason, and I'm not familiar with that was before my time. And um, if you mention the name, I'm sure I could tell you exactly who it was. He had a letter there. He was a 33rd degree mason, and I don't know what the big deal was. Maybe they exposed it to the moon atmosphere or something, but um, it's clearly visible in the picture. And they have it and on display, the picture showing this, and they have the actual apron there, too. They also have um, President Bush's. Some of his cufflinks was pres- um, by President Quayle. They had a couple letters from Mrs. Bush. Um, Albert Pike has his own room, just like J. Edgar Hoover, and he supposedly has over four or 500 actual writings or works, and Morals and Dogma were everywhere in that room. The, pul- the library is open to the public, and the library is just loaded with Masonic literature, and anyone can go read this stuff and find it for themselves. It's, it's clear. And, uh, now, can you imagine how much power they had in the United States and in the world with J. Edgar Hoover, a 33rd degree Freemason, hand-picking the agents for the Federal Bureau of Investigation, digging up dirt on all the people in office throughout this country, and then paying them a visit and telling them, hey, we got this, this, and this on you, and if you don't go along with us, you're sunk. And we know that happened because it has been revealed throughout the years that that's exactly what J. Edgar Hoover did. And this, ladies and gentlemen, accounts for a lot of the actions of the Federal Bureau of Investigation in recent years. And with Randy Weaver, with Gordon Call, up on Whidbey Island, with the MOVE group, with the Sibianese Liberation Army, which, by the way, was created in a mind control experiment in the prison system in California, which was documented, folks, by the Napa, by the Napa Sentinel, and the most recent debacle, the massacre at Waco, Texas. What else did you find, Paul? Um... At the Masonic Temple or at the Library of Congress? or Anything. <laughs> I did find uh, a couple books at the Library of Congress with the 13th Amendment. Stated word for word. Um, they were in the rare book collection, and I mean, it's all... So they have, in fact, taken the real 13th Amendment from the Constitution and substituted it with something else. Exactly. And what's interesting is that, you know, the problem I have with that is the Constitution in my eyes, is the highest document in the land, and it's nothing to be tampered with. And all the research we've dug up on that, it sure looks like it's been tampered with, and what's fascinating is very few, if any of us, knew anything about it. That's right. These people are, in fact, traitors. Exactly, and the people have to realize they better look up the word treason, and they better learn. I used but when I grew up, I used to respect Americans for having a backbone and standing up for what's right and being brave and courageous, and... All I can say is they better look up the word treason and they better start realizing which politicians, and I've talked with a lot of them personally, and there are very few, unfortunately, that are on our side. They know exactly what's going on and they've been part of it. I mean, in the documentation, you'll find the most current records we have found on the updates on Public Law 7297, which is talking about a complete and total disarmament. Conveniently, some of the voting records don't exist. But the people better realize how their own representatives in the House and Senate are voting on these things and make them accountable. And if they're selling out the country, get them out of office and get some decent people in because this is flat out treason and it's, they're getting so bold. And as you know, you go through all this documentation, so you're gonna, the people are going to start realizing how bold they are. A lot of these newspaper articles, I got leads from other people, and some of them I just ran across skimming through the papers, and they are very bold. They, they, I just mentioned to you, it's on its way. Um, uh, front page, Washington Times, December 15th. The new Army manual that comes out next month shows our troops literally under the United Nations. And it's about time people realize that, you know, our troops in Desert Storm, Desert Shield, whatever they want to call it, there were no insignias on those vehicles. Desert scam is the real word. There you go. That's exactly what it was. And I have George Bush's exact quote from the weekly compilation. I just got that. 
where he said that Desert Storm, that whatever war you want to call it, that was implementing the New World Order, word for word from a government printing, um, government printing office document. And the people, I mean, the documentation is all available. The key is, is now we got to start moving ahead and start realizing the traitors, they have to be taken out of office. And, you know, we're not, if, they, if, they're, if they're scared about doing that, they better realize, they better reflect back on Russia and communism and socialism. They better understand what it is in their mind, and they better start reading Gorbachev's own book called Terra Striker, which some of it's in the documentation, where he is openly a socialist, he is openly a communist, and he just happens to have an office on the Presidio, the oldest long-running military base in the United States in San Francisco. And anyone can go get his phone number out of the library. They can write him and find out who's on his board, which is interesting. It's a bunch of congressmen, ex-congressmen. Mm -hmm. And, and ex-high officials of the United States government, I might add. Yes, very high. And he is listed as an official advisor to the President of the United States of America. And in his book, he states, Don't be fooled by the dissolution of the Soviet Union. And one interesting comment I might add, when you get into the State Department document with that when um, Gorbachev and Reagan signed the INF Treaty, uh -huh. you'll find in the fine printer that Mr. Schultz even says he read Gorbachev's book. That's right. So he's very aware of what's going on. That's right. And he's conveniently on the advisory board. But the people better realize, I mean... Um, Gorbachev is more than clear and open as to what he's doing. It's the One World Order and that if they think this is painful, well, they better project themselves into the future in the socialist, communist, That's right. police state. And if they, this is heaven compared to what they're going to start facing down the future. And I'm not being, I'm not raining on anybody's parade. When they start reading the actual government documents and start digging for themselves, it's a rude awakening, but it's true, and we got to wake up. That's right, and we're out of time, Paul. I want to thank you very much for being our guest tonight. I want to thank you so much for all the work that you've done, most of it unsung in, in, in libraries, at tables late at night, and uh, the sweat that you put in for this country. Uh, I think it's going to go a long way to help liberate us. Um, Right. For our Bill of Rights. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, form your militia units. There will be no political solution to this, ladies and gentlemen, and you will not find relief in the courts. Good night, and God bless each and every one of you.